17 years in the park, I knew of two trees that had nuts. It's a 12,000 acre park, Hobbs State Park Conservation Area. So I had, I had some good times and, and some bad times, especially the bad finding those trees did. An ice storm in 09 broke a lot of our best trees. And when you damage a cheap tree, it allows the, the orange colored light, the chestnut light, to get in and infect it. It's like a, it's like a tree cancer that slowly uh, causes the tree to die. So, along came <coughs> this young man in Missouri. He talked to this old man who told him about a tree when he was young that the local people loved to eat and that it had birds, and, but now they're all gone, he told Steve. Well, the rest of the story most of you can imagine because he's the man who stood here a while ago and he's the president of the foundation, Steve Bost. He didn't take this, this gentleman's word that the trees are all gone. He started searching after a while in the woods of southern Missouri, he started finding nutty trees. And that inspired him to become the man that he is now. So uh, I told him to notify me when my time was up. Where are you, Steve? <laughs> Until one day, I, I was walking the trail and 
I saw the nut burgers on the ground on one side of the train. I had to see them all close in, in that area. So I looked up and there was some more burgers. This tree was a canopy sized tree, you know, 60, 70 feet tall. But it had two, two main limbs and half was alive, the other half was dead. And I understand that the whole tree would go pretty quick once a main limb dies on it. That tree did, did, did die, fell over, it had a few sucker shoots came up, maybe waist high, and they died in a couple of years. The tree now is on the ground. Take it on the ground. And by the way, that wood is excellent wood from, the, from these, these trees. Yeah. Very good. Well, so these kind of recollections are real important. And, uh, and how many of y'all have uh, ever been inspired by someone here in this room? Raise your hand. Yeah. Y'all can think of a, a favorite teacher you may have had before. Uh, okay. And I guarantee if you can think of somebody in your life that maybe inspired you or did something that changed your life, it's probably somebody that took a special interest into you. And uh, today's program that I've got for you is, is about the Ozark Chica Pen and about what I've seen and my experience with it and everybody else that uh, has got on board. We've all uh, made contributions to make all this happen, this incredible work. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about this. Uh, I don't think any of us fully realize the impact we have on other people around us or the world around us. We really don't. So I want you to be thinking about that today. And never underestimate the power that one person could have. And uh, sometimes I take time off to go fishing. That's my son. He's a little bit younger and he's 17 today. And, uh, and I have a lot of things I like to do. And I've come to find out and realize that really all that's kind of helped me with what uh, we're working on today. And so I love the garden, plant fruit trees, grow trees. Uh, this is uh, my daughter, Leslie, I don't want to embarrass you. Can you raise your hand? Uh, she's going to be one of our speakers here in just a little bit. You'll hear a little bit more about her. You can tell this a long time ago. Again, she's about 14. So, uh, but anyhow, um, uh, in the contrast, I think sometimes, like when you drive around this area around here, it's so beautiful. And when I was coming back today, I thought, this is one of the most beautiful places I've seen in a long time. If you haven't gone a little further on Highway 7, you need to. And, but sometimes over here, this close to something, you tend to kind of sometimes take it for granted. I don't care if it's the arch at St. Louis, or if it's a beautiful prairie, or if it's a, a spring, and you know, we, we tend to kind of do that. Well, I grew up in the farmland where you have uh, flat land and muddy ditches, and but we had a cabin on uh, the Kirk River up in Missouri, and about every weekend we would go up there. And so uh, that's where I met this guy that could not be here today. And uh, this is my son, he was younger, and so he camped out here and bow hunted, and we got to know him real good. And, uh, you know, I, I've been to college, got a couple of degrees, and you finally get to the point where you realize uh, you don't know anything. Once you learn enough, you finally get to that point. Well, this gentleman, Harold, was telling me about um, um, these trees that were, had nuts that were really good to eat. And uh, he was telling about how they grew all over the Ozarks, they were real abundant at one time. Now they're all gone. Nobody's ever heard about them. I thought, well, how come I've never heard about this? And so I was kind of fascinated. That, that was in, I guess, 19, uh, that would have been 88. And then the next year, in 89, I talked to him a little bit more about those trees. And, and then uh, things progressed, and I, I started thinking, well, how come nobody's done anything about this? So one thing led to another, and I said, I, I bet there's some out there. He said, no, uh, I've talked to all kinds of people around the woods. Nobody's seen them, they're all gone. And so anyhow, so uh, I never will forget what he told me. If he'd been here today, he'd say this to you. This is what uh, he told me, and I've interviewed other people, and this is pretty well common what you'll hear about these trees. <clears throat> 93, yeah, I need to update this a little bit. So anyhow, it's, it's amazing <coughs> how he inspired me, and, and I thought, you know what, I'm not just going to listen to this and not try to do anything about it. And uh, so I, I started trying to look and find some of these trees that were supposed to not be here anymore. So those are Chinkapin, Castanea, Ozarkensis, sometimes called the Ozark Chinkapin or Ozark Chestnut. It was drought, to drought tolerant, grew, grew to 65 feet taller, two to three feet in diameter, and it bloomed in late May, early June. Really around June 1 is probably the best.
as time for it. And they produced a bounty of sweet nuts every year without fail. And it was sought by humans and wildlife. And so I, I interviewed other people and I keep hearing the same thing over and over again. And uh, uh, where's Mark Stokes at? This is kind of like what you hear with the American chestnut. You know, you've heard these before though. And so with the Ozark chicken pen though, it's a little bit different though. Um, and I'm going to explain a few things to you about why that's a little bit different. And uh, so, so plentiful, the nuts were so abundant, you scoop them up with flat blade shovels and uh, you know, you eat them or sell them or use for livestock food. And it was more dependable than a crop of corn, and now they're all gone and nobody's heard of them. And so when I was hearing this, I was thinking, you know, something needs to be done about this. And so I kept waiting for somebody to do something about it, and I knew people that knew about them. And uh, so this tree grew not just in the Ozarks, it grew in northern Louisiana, East Texas, Oklahoma. Uh, we found remnant populations um, uh, today in Mississippi and in Alabama, uh, possibly in Georgia. I've never had that confirmed yet. And we know for a fact uh, at least one pocket in Virginia was confirmed. So this is a gentleman that's uh, actually, he's a Cherokee Indian, and he was telling me on the phone about this. He said, you know, when I was a kid growing up, he said, my feet were real tough. I'd step on those spiky burrs. And if you don't know what he's talking about, right there in that red bowl is a bunch of them for you to experiment with if you want to see how spiky they are. And he told me, he said, uh, but uh, I'd step on one of those and said, man, it sure would hurt. And he said, but they're the sweetest nut you've ever eaten. And he said, uh, you know, the blind reached Oklahoma in the 60s. And so it started out on the East Coast about 1904, and it moved, and it made its way to about where we're at, about 1957, and it reaches uh, Oklahoma in, in about 1963. But he says they grew a little bit of everywhere on the hillsides and the creek bank, and they weren't real large. you got to remember that he's talking about second growth timber. Everything's been logged over. And uh, so this is, uh, he said, I would love to see another chicken pen before I die, but I don't think I ever will. And so I actually sent seed to him, and he planted with his grandchildren, and I sent him grow tubes. That's kind of what we're doing now, this kind of stuff. And by the way, he's also on our board, and uh, so we're real fortunate to have this kind of experience. So they grew a little bit of everywhere. So what happened to him? Well, to understand this, you've got to understand what happened to the American chestnut. And Mark said it real good. Uh, uh, you call them the what of the Eastern Forest? Uh, the Redwoods. The Redwoods Eastern Forest. They grew gigantic. And you look at these pictures, that's a dead tree, but they were incredibly large. And Mark, uh, about one out of four trees, roughly, eastern U.S. was an American chestnut. Yeah, well, maybe along the Southern Appalachian Mountains, got that high percentage, but not, not generally. You know. Right. That's where the, the highest concentration was at. Well, this disease that was brought over here, uh, they think now it may be in the late 1800s when it first showed up, but it was noticed in the Bronx Zoo in New York in 1904. So this disease began to spread and it wiped out 3.7, that's B with a billion trees, and, uh, and it reduced them uh, to uh, a shrub-like status. And so once it crossed the Mississippi River, it began to attack the Ozark chinka pens that we had here west of the Mississippi River. And a lot of confusion. Uh, before uh, the 1920s, 1930s, they just called them all chinka pens. That's what they said, chinka pens. And, but they made references that if you were west of the Mississippi River, for some reason, these trees grew really, really large. And so there's an old uh, Ozark chinka pen trunk, and that's uh, near the Arkansas Missouri border. And here's uh, the stump sprouts, and this is what you see. Instead of being a tree, now what you have is blighted stump sprouts, and they'll get up about you know, 12 feet tall, they'll uh, blight and re-sprout again, but it's no longer an upper canopy tree. There's a lot of confusion because there's another tree called the um, Allegheny chinka pen, and it, its regular growth pattern is real similar to this. So now we went from a tree to something that could be confused for an Allegheny, which more like a shrub. And so, uh, so I began to look, and uh, I started looking at the state champion list of Ozark chinka pens, and, and um, I found one in 1991, and this was in Clark County, Arkansas. There's actually two Ozark chinka pens. Uh, they're not joined together. They, these two are separate. And this tree right here was right at 22 inches diameter. It was the largest living Ozark chinka pen that had never died of that disease. So I thought, that's where I want to go. So it took a while, I tracked down this guy's uh, uh, phone number, and I called him.
called him and he said, well, you're a little bit too late. He said, we had a tornado and it actually uh, blew that tree down and ripped it up out of the ground. This one was blown across this road. And he said, uh, we're out right now, the chainsaw, we just cut it off and the stump snapped back in place right here. And so that was the largest living known Ozark chinkapin on planet Earth. The good news though is a friend of mine actually got the seed that year before and the genetics of that tree, thanks to all this good work we're doing, it's even represented at Hobbs State Park and in Missouri and uh, uh, Indian Trails Conservation Area and I think Cossetown State Park has some as well too. So uh, we went from a, um, a tree to blighted stump sprouts like what you see now. So that's what we're facing. And also too, uh, we do a lot of fire. Uh, the Osage Indians that lived here long before the Shawnee and Delaware got into northern Arkansas or southern Missouri, it was the Osage. And they burned this land for thousands of years. And, uh, and so this tree learned to evolve with fire. Now though, You've got dead wood on these blighted stumps, and when you have a fire, it will sit there and it'll smolder for, for two or three days, and it will kill a lot of these sprouts in immediate proximity to it. So what used to be something that helped it now is something detrimental to it. So logging practices and later the chestnut blight, um, Prophenectria parasitica would wipe out the Ozark cheek pen. Today, only blighted stump sprouts remain this once important tree, and sprouts emerge from them, and many of them manage and sometimes produce nuts if they get up big enough. But within four to six years, the blight strikes again, and the process repeats, and the number of surviving trees in the historic range of them continue to shrink, and uh, also the number of people that remember them. This wood is real rock resistant. Um, there's a lady in Connecticut sent me a picture, and you've probably seen it, Mark, from Sandra, uh, that real large American chestnut out in that pasture had never been burned. That's from before World War One. And this is extremely rock resistant wood. And here's a sprout right here you can see from an Ozark chinkapin. And look how the insects have really been eating on that. And uh, so everything went after the nuts and even the leaves. So the forest that we have have changed quite a bit. Um, in, uh, uh, in southern Missouri, Arkansas, uh, in Missouri, they went after the short leaf pine primarily in southern and southeastern Missouri. And uh, we had one time up a little town uh, at Grand Missouri, the largest timber mill in the entire United States. So our forest went through a huge transformation. And this is a, a log slide along Kern River. <clears throat> so what they would do if they cleared the land off, they would burn it and they would use it for grazing. So uh, it, it was detrimental to a lot of ecosystems and wildlife that been there. And so where it used to be a forest, the virgin forest, the virgin forest, as far as you can see would be in the Ozarks would be a sea of stumps as far as you can see. And uh, so the lost range of the Ozark Chinkapin. This is uh, one of the oldest maps uh, that I found in a book. It's from 1907. Keep in mind, they just lumped all the Chinkapins together, even the Allegheny as well. And uh, we found out some interesting stuff about the Allegheny. Uh, they grow a lot smaller leaf and a smaller nut. And uh, uh, once you see them, you can tell the difference. But if you'll look at this, it shows um, a pretty good size range that extends all the way up into New England. And uh, so the Ozark Chickapin, uh, uh, if you had to actually have a true map, it would include parts of Oklahoma as well. Mississippi's left out. I'm not sure why, but it's left out as well. So the historic range of them, if you look at tree books today, they show a real small range, about like what you see barely in Missouri. Uh, barely into Oklahoma, but mainly in Arkansas. And uh, if you go back a little bit in the 1980s, you see a little bit more range in Missouri, and it changes a little bit in Oklahoma, a little sliver in Alabama. So I was thinking, how could you have Ozark chickapins in Alabama, and it skips all the way over to here? You know, something didn't seem quite right. So the more I started looking and checking and researching different libraries uh, in Missouri, Arkansas and Oklahoma and Texas, I began to uncover some things. So uh, if you go back in the 40s, they're showing a larger range. And then finally you get back to 1907. 